Hello and welcome to the Sightshed Podcast. My name is Matt Jones and today you are joining us for episode 174 of our Toolbox Talks. Um, we're having a conversation today with a fellow out of Florida in the United States and um, this young guy has got an amazing business over there that has certainly seen a, some rapid growth. He's a member of our Facebook community. We've had some really good conversations um, online through some of his posts and things like that. And uh, I thought it would be great to get him on the show just to have a chat about, I suppose, his journey and how he's, um, his business has grown over the years and how it continues to grow. Uh, it was really interesting because a lot of the conversations, uh, a lot of the things that he mentioned in his business are things that uh, I hear a lot of guys talking about and we talk a lot about as well, things like organizational charts, growth strategies, uh, roles and responsibilities, training, staff retention, all that kind of stuff. Um, this guy definitely has got all of that down, and uh, it, it's a real, it's it's really encouraging to see um, young guys like uh, like Corey, who on this show here um, certainly has been able to learn and implement some of these amazing things that he's learned through either um, reading books, listening to podcasts, audio books, and all that kind of stuff, training programs. So yeah, it's a really good conversation. I'm sure you guys get a lot out of it. Um, if you want to find out more, you can head across to the show notes at thesideshow.com. And um, if you did get something out of this, or if you wanted Corey to uh, follow up on any specific questions, uh, by all means, just ask wherever you see this come through. If you see it on social media, you can write a comment there um, and I can get him back on the show to talk about that. He's already said that he'd like to uh, come back on the show, which is fantastic. So uh, he's more than happy to answer your questions, guys. Uh, There's also some really cool resources that he's got um, through his blog page, which I will stem to uh, through the show notes. So I encourage you to guys go and check that out as well. Okay, that's all from me. So uh, let's jump into this recording with Corey Phillip from Florida in the United States. For those of you guys that have been following the Sightshed podcast and in our community for a while, you know we do enjoy doing some pretty darn cool things. Uh, our learn and travel program has been around for a few years now, and we effectively take trade business owners across to amazing destinations uh, where we can either surf or ski. So um, the last few years, we have been uh, traveling to New Zealand on ski, uh, learn and ski programs. We've been traveling to Japan earlier this year on a ski and learn program. That's 2018. And then uh, we also traveled to the Maldives for our first surf and learn in 2018. However, uh, in February of 2019, we are holding yet another ski and learn, and it's going to be in the lovely Furano in Japan. And uh, Furano is basically up in the Hokkaido region, which is powder heaven. So for all of you guys that want to come along to that, and I thoroughly encourage you to because they are such cool events. They are just the best. It's a tax deductible trip. You get to go skiing or surfing in amazing locations. And this time, this time we're heading to one of the best powder resorts on the planet. So uh, guys, head across to the siteshed.com forward slash events and you can see the link there to the upcoming event. Uh, it's limited tickets, guys. Obviously, we've got to secure hotels and that kind of thing, so we can only take so many. Uh, we launched it a couple of days back and it is already filling up. So if you want to come, um, I thoroughly encourage you to get in there and get your deposit secured. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can hit us up on the Facebook group. Giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. Hello there, listeners, and welcome back to Toolbox Talks on the Site Shed podcast. Thank you once again for sharing your earbuds with me, regardless of where you are around this wonderful planet. And you're joining me today for a conversation I'm having with Corey Phillip. Corey's all the way from the US. Corey, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. You betcha. And so, Corey, where are you based? I'm based out of uh, Fort Myers, Florida, southwest Florida, maybe three hours from Orlando. That kind of puts it into perspective for everyone internationally. Everyone knows where Orlando is. So three hours south of there, sunny southwest Florida. It's an awesome place and uh, running the company from there. Nice, nice. And um, what is the company? So the company is Gulf Coast Aluminum. We do structures that are called screen enclosures and they're relatively unique to us in southwest florida they exist kind of in our area and a few other states around there you could think of us as an exterior contractor we do patio and deck type of work gotcha okay so um you've been a member of our community now for a while and you've posted some uh, cool things in there so one of the uh things that you've reached out to us about was a, I suppose we could call it a philosophy that you put together if, um, from a sales perspective, which um, was a pretty good conversation we had going in the group. So I thought I'd get you back on the show to learn a little bit about 
I suppose you, your business, where you came from, and um, then as a result, um, a little bit about this uh, whole philosophy you've got in terms of uh, your selling strategy. So thank you for your time. Much appreciated. I'm not quite sure what time it is over there. What time would it be? Uh, right now, it's 7 p.m. in the evening. Okay. So there you go. It's 9 a.m. here and it's 7 p.m. there. So it works pretty well. <laughs> We're totally opposites here. <laughs> That's cool. So tell us a little bit about Gulf Coast Aluminium or Gulf Coast Aluminum, as uh, you North Americans like to mispronounce. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I'm so, married um, to one, so I can make fun. Mixed one of us, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how we all say it over here. It's all aluminum. Occasionally, we'll get you know a lot of customers from outside of the country, and they will say the alu- aluminum or something like that. But uh, we call it aluminum. To be fair, we actually spell it aluminum, so we have an extra I in there. Oh, so, you guys have an extra I. Yeah, in yeah, I so. couldn't imagine that. I mean, <laughs> you know, when I'm dealing with vendors and customers, and I have to repeat our email address, which has aluminum in it. Right. I have to repeat that so many times just to get the spelling correct. I couldn't imagine if we had another I in there. That would just complicate it to hell. Yeah. Well, I imagine if you were running a, a global business, you would have to uh, secure both those domains because um, I think there's a lot of places around the world that <laughs> <laughs> spell it differently. But anyway. Maybe one day, maybe one day we'll be a global company. But uh, for now, there's tons <laughs> of market just in a you know a few county. I, I'll yeah. say county every Everyone in North America will understand that, but that's kind of, I guess, maybe like a province in your area. Yeah. Um, but there's just more market than we can capture locally. I mean, it's it's a growing market over here and very big market. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, so anyways, yeah, you'd asked, uh, well, I mean, you brought up a lot, you know, the story, I guess I should just start from the whole beginning. Well, how about, I suppose, let's take it back a notch. So, um, you know, let's tell us a little bit about, did you grow up in Florida? Yeah, I grew up in the Southwest Florida, right where I am now and operating the business. I uh, went to college there, you know, when I was young, 18, I was 21, graduating college and got in touch with, um, you know, my kind of friend, I guess I shouldn't say got in touch. It makes it sound like we were, you know, in contact or anything, but my high school friend that I had done this work with when I was in high school, you know, we kind of started talking like, Hey, remember when we were younger and we were teenagers in high school and we're like, let's start this company. Let's do this. You know, we could have a, you know, we could have an awesome business here and really, really take things up a level, you know, and really yeah. do well. And we're graduating college at this point. We're 21. That came back up and it was just kind of like now is the time. There's no point in in deferring this any longer. Let's start this business and get it off the ground. And just like that, we were off. So were you, when you went to college, what were you studying? Uh, I was studying accounting. So nothing <laughs> at all business. And, you know, now the accounting stuff is behind me. And while I did learn that, uh, you know, just one of those things that never really came to be much fruition in the bi- real business world. So coming from, um, that's interesting, actually, I would have thought accounting would have uh, been extremely relevant to come to a stage where you want to run your own business. Yeah, you know, a lot of people think that, but when it comes to managing business and money, it's right. essentially revenue comes in, revenue goes out. It's fairly a simple concept. And if you can be disciplined, if you understand it, it's not hard to understand. Once you understand it, as long as you can maintain some discipline, you're golden, you know? So a lot of the upper level stuff that they teach you in academics just doesn't really come back to apply in the world of running and operating a business. And uh, there's Randall DeHart. He's a construction accountant. You might've had him on your podcast. I'm not sure, but he's on quite a few trades podcasts. He always says, your business is 80% sales and marketing, 10% accounting, and then 10% actual operations. And I like that line, especially coming from him, who's a long time practicing accounting. It just shows how much emphasis and focus there should be on the marketing and sales side of things, because that's really what makes your business tick. It's funny, actually, you say that, because um, I was just last night reading, uh, <clears throat> I'm reading once again, uh, the uh, Al Levy, who's been a re- regular guest on the show, and he's uh, he's the, the seven power contractor, but I'm reading his book once again. And last night, I was reading through the chapter where he's talking about the difference in accounting and there's your tax accounting, which is the accounting that you'll learn at school and they, you know, your, your accountant will drill into you and then there's real world accounting <laughs> and there's, exactly, two, and there's yeah. two different and then things. Then there's accrual accounting on top of that, you know? So right. at the end of the day though, if you've got no sales and revenue coming in, you've got nothing to account for. And I yeah. always say you can outsource your accounting. Uh, some trades can even outsource our, their actual production and operation through subcontractors. Mm-hmm. But as a small business, you have to be your best salesperson. 
So tell me, I'm a little, I'm interested into how you, that, that transition into, well, what we would call here a trade, which um, effectively, you know, is your business. Obviously, if you've come from an accounting background, you wouldn't have had much of a clue when it comes to, you know, like the aluminum world. So how did that transition look and how did you learn that? Okay, well, yeah, I'd actually done the aluminum work starting as a teenager. That was my very first job when I was like 14 years old. A hurricane came through my area, uh, absolutely leveled all of the exterior post and beam style structures that work on now. So that was my first job. It was time to get a job. Boom, that was it. Uh, And then through college, I also worked for a general contractor. And at that point, I got my hands into more of the administration, the permitting, the scheduling, stuff like that. So I'd had my hands in the trade essentially since I could work. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. So did, in terms of um, actually becoming a aluminum contractor, is there any like specific courses or training that you need to do which is legislated? Yeah, it is an actual legislated license here in the United States. You just can't you know, go into business and do it. You have to pass a test. It's a fairly complicated test. I was able to study it or to study enough and pass it in that manner. They really don't offer much in the way of courses strategically focused on this type of test right. uh, that, you know, like they do for a general contractor or electrician or HVAC, they've got specific courses that right. basically just focus on passing that. So aluminum is actually difficult in the sense that you can't sign up and take a course with somebody that, you know, is familiar with the test. So going into the test, you're actually kind of going into it blind almost, or that's how I felt. But then you also have to qualify through having experience, either working in the trade or uh, supervising projects, you know, working through a general contractor like I did. I met the requirements in multiple, uh, multiple points, multiple aptitudes, I guess you could say. Uh, so was, there was no issue with me actually qualifying for the license when it came time to take the test and start the business. It's interesting. I, I've had loads of um, North Americans on the show, um, everything from you know plumbers, HVAC, painting, home renovations, et cetera, all this stuff. And I, I think there's a really big difference in the, like here in Australia, you pretty much can't have any trade without serving a relatively substantial apprenticeship in order to, to teach you the skills of the trade um and you've got to be certified and all that well i should i should say you should be certified there's a there's always people that aren't (laughs) yeah so in my state of florida for the aluminum specialty contractor license you have to have three years of trade experience and then one year of supervisory experience okay and that's kind of the general rule of thumb there are a few other exceptions and ways around that such as uh, if you bought a business, I believe, or if you have a college degree, that counts for some of your experience and stuff. But yeah. in general, you do have to have some trade experience before you can actually be licensed for it. Cool. So what's unique about your company then? How are you guys, I suppose, different to the rest? Well, we put a lot of emphasis on com- customer service. That's number one. And we really just run a professional operation. And that sounds that sounds so basic and bland, but many of our competitors just aren't doing that. Mm-hmm. And to us, it just seems so standard. You know, treat the customer as you would want you, yourself to be treated if you were the customer. I guess golden rule one to one right there. And just run a professional operation and a tight ship. So many contractors don't do it. You know, you call them to get an estimate and they say, oh, we'll call you back. And then they never call you back. And then the customer has to chase you down and then scheduling and delays like that. So we run a really tight ship, treat all the customers extremely well. That's, you know, gotten us very, very far. And of course, we use internet, online marketing and stuff to sell our services and market. We don't do much offline. Everything that we're doing at this point is online. So you run a blog called Home Pro Success. um, And on that blog there, you talk about numerous different experiences and you've got different posts which talk about things from, you know, how to avoid getting bad reviews and all this kind of stuff. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was your uh, valve stem sales strategy, which kind of ties in, I think, to what you just said then about being professional. Um, You've sort of put together a bit of a philosophy here, which um, runs through the sales process. And it's interesting. I'm I'm just curious as to uh, how you refined that process and how you came up with that um, philosophy and then how it's been uh, split tested and evolved over the years to become what it is now. Yeah, good question. That that post has gotten a lot of feedback from contractors in my group and friends that I know and everyone that's seen it. So I got into you know the business, but I had no experience selling. And I would go out, meet with customers, scratch out my estimate. Hey, you know, Miss Jones, your project's going to be five thousand dollars. And there'd kind of be like this awkward moment of silence. We'd look at each other, and they'd be like, "Okay, we're going to think about it, and we'll call you back." 
And if you've been in sales, you know that that call you back doesn't happen that often. It can happen, but it doesn't just happen like, a, oh, we'll call you back. We're ready to go for it. Doesn't always happen like that. And at the same time, I'd hear stories of salespeople that were well-trained salespeople that are going out and closing 40, 50% of their jobs or more. And I wanted to be one of those salespeople. I wanted to be able to get in front of a customer and know that I've got a realistic shot at you know bringing back a signed contract and a deposit. And that was vital to grow the business. Mm-hmm. So I'm at this point going out, out there with all these customers, walking away probably 80% of the time with nothing in hand, no project, no deal, nothing to get started on. And I'm hearing all these stories about everybody that can close well. So I start kind of researching it and looking into ways to improve the closing process. Then I ended up with a connection uh, in the same trade, but located several hours away where they practice. And they sell a lot. Um, They sell tons of projects. So I was able to get in with them and go do some on-site sales training with them. And what they were doing was essentially hard sell tactics. You know, they would look you in the eye and say, can you afford this? (laughs) And go at it like that. (laughs) And that's just not my style. You know, I really hate salespeople. (laughs) I'm not a natural salesperson by any means of the, by any stretch of the imagination. So that wasn't my style. So I knew I needed to come up with something better. Yeah. And at that point, I started piecing together my own system. And, you know, I started realizing that customers, when they see the price, they are naturally inclined to just say no. They don't want to feel like they're being sold. Okay, I got the price. Now they're going to try to sell me. And in traditional sales methods, that's what it was. It was all about overcoming objections and just kind of going for a close. Yeah. So in the valve stem sales strategy, after we give the price, we take the focus off of the price and then go into telling the company's story, how, you know, how our company came to be, why we're in business, why we show up to work every day, what goes on behind the scenes, and then also show the projects that are similar to the project we're out there estimating at that moment to build trust. And then after that, go for the close. So rather than price close, we're going into the story trust building, which a lot of people do early on in the sales process and then ultimately can't come back to it at the end. We're positioning it at the end. And I find that it's much more valuable there. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, we do a similar thing, I suppose, with um with uh, our sales process, but ours is a little bit different, I guess, because I mean, we've got um, ours isn't such a face to face sales process because we got clients all over the world, so we tend to we tend to deliver that case study sort of scenario during the proposal phase, which which does work, which does work very well. And the other thing is, um, like we we kind of treat it as a bit of a qualifier. So we have like a a process which is even before the sales process kicks off. It's basically when the inquiry comes in, we go through a qualification process with um with with our leads, <clears throat> which makes I suppose it does two things. First of all, it, it it gets the customer thinking about questions that we're going to answer and gets them thinking a little bit more long term. And then it also brings into perspective the reality of whether or not we're going to be a good fit for each other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do the whole thing too with qualifying them. Uh, not everybody, you know, is a match and a fit for our company. So we do have a fairly rigorous qualification process up front. And this really works though to close the deal. Uh, you know, with in-home sales, all the contractors out there listening can relate to it. You're in somebody's home, a fairly personable space. You're going through, you're working up the numbers. Now you give them the number. How do you get from that point from once they get that number and they kind of put up this barrier that's like, don't be sold today. How do you get from that point to closing? And that's uh, that's the point that this sales strategy really focuses on. And if you're out there listening, certainly be qualifying your customers. We all know just how expensive it is to drop what you're doing and run around giving estimates. Even when you have a sales team, a dedicated sales team, it's still costly. Yeah. And it's something that we're implementing with a lot of our clients now as well, especially the guys that do project work. We're, like, we're helping them really qualify uh, the conversations they're having with their leads so that they're not wasting time on the call. And even yesterday, I had a scenario where you know some guy, um, he he must have he found one of our um, articles online or something, and he sent us an inquiry. And I said, "Hey, listen, before we have this conversation, just so we're on the same page, could you go fill in this form?" He filled in the form. Um, I called him back, read through the answers on his um, on his form. I called him back to have the conversation because at that point he's more he's ready to have the conversation. And um, he basically gave the whole uh, you know, well, 
There's absolutely no way that I'd be paying that because one of the first things we address is price because I want to make sure that, you know, I don't want to have a, a 30 minute conversation with someone who's not even in the ballpark, right? So one of the first absolutely. things that we do is bring up price. And he's like, there's absolutely no way in hell I would ever pay that. You're absolutely kidding yourself. I get, and he's like, oh, we can get this for so much cheaper. And I'm like, well, why don't you then? He's like, well, what do you mean? Why don't? What do you mean? Why don't I? I'm like, well, why don't you? Why are you even talking to me right now? <laughs> and then, yeah. You know, and, then, and then he kept going. Well, I can't believe you that you would, you know that would be a price. I'm like, you don't even know what you're comparing to. I haven't even given you a proposal yet. I'm just telling you this is where the ballparks are, and this is what they normally for these reasons. This is why it costs this. This is what goes into it. And he's like, well, well, I, I'm a startup business. I'm like, oh, and I just said to him straight up, I go, we don't typically work with startup businesses. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. No, that I mean was that's great. all. That's all about knowing who your target market is, knowing what the cu- perfect customer avatar is, and qualifying them. Yeah. As a small trades operation, you can't serve everyone. It's physically impossible to do, especially when you're operating with limited resources, usually in the form of uh, you know human resources and staffing. That's always a problem. Yeah. So you can't. So you do. You do need to have a qualification process. I'll kind of share one of our favorite qualification questions that we'll usually ask right off the bat. And it's even on the online estimate request form on our website. Actually, I'm not sure if it's there at the moment or not. Uh, the website changes pretty regularly. But if it's not there now, it probably will be back up in a couple of days. But uh, we generally ask, have you read any of our online reviews or have you read our reviews? And based on how they answer that, we segment our customers off. If they have read them, you know, they know what they're getting into. They know the level of quality and they know that our commitment to quality and service So they're a little bit more qualified. If they have not, we'll probably put them off into a nurturing system to make sure that they get those reviews, get a chance to absorb them, and then come back to us for an estimate later. Or at least that they see that content and those reviews before we schedule something to go on site and really firm up the numbers. So do you um you work it, uh with your business um is it is do you you have a partner, right? Is, is that right? With the Yeah, absolutely I do. Yep. Okay, cool. And so I'm a little bit I'm curious as to um how you guys how the partnership works. And this is the this is the fellow that you grew up with, right? The guy you were talking about Absolutely, earlier. Absolutely, yeah. yeah cool, I have cool. been friends since we were teenagers. Yeah, great, great. So how did you guys decide on when you're building the structure of the business, who's gonna fulfill what roles, who's gonna be the head of what departments and all that kind of stuff? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. There's a lot I could say on that. Um, I guess I'll kind of start and preface it by saying it's not all dandelions and fairy tales. You know, there's <laughs> gonna, there, there have been a lot of problems over the years, but we're both level-headed. I mean, it's been a great partnership. Uh, we're both level-headed, focused on the long, same long-term goals and all that. Uh, now, as far as who fulfills what roles, we certainly didn't have any of that planned out, you know, when we were going into this. It was just kind of let's sell and see what we can do. We're licensed. We're all ready to go. You know, let's just kind of dive in head first. I mean, it was truly a dive into the lion pit head first. And looking back, I don't even know how we made it to the point where we are now, um, mm-hmm. you know, which is a fairly large, nearly eight figure company annually. I don't know how, yeah, I, I'm fl- having flashbacks in my mind at the moment. I'm like, wow, how did two 21 year olds end up here at this point? And fast forward now we're 28. <laughs> so that was seven years ago. I mean, if I could go back in time and knowing what I know now and betting on whether or not we were going to succeed or fail, this would have been all a failure. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we went into it. We're both sharp and we just figured it out as we went. Uh, I ultimately got more into the sales side of things. I, I knew that we needed to get a website up. I guess this is how it all worked. I knew we needed to get a website up in the very beginning. I knew that was crucial. And I went on a mission to teach myself how to build a website and get that set up, you know, right from the very beginning. And I would say that was probably the uh, the fork in the path where I started heading off towards sales. And he let me take over handling all that stuff while operations was going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Or not behind the scenes, but on the side of that. And from that, I started growing off into the sales and marketing side of things and making sure all the administrative stuff is done. And he slid over to operations. So does he, Thomas is his name, right? Is that what you said, Tom? Yeah. yeah okay. So um, he basically um, looks after the installers and that kind of stuff. Does he like more of the on-site stuff, whereas you turn to manage more of the, the managerial office-related operations delivery kind of stuff? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm at this point in charge of the sales team and marketing, uh, the administrative office type of stuff. We have an office, office manager for all that, so I'm largely yep. out of the picture on that. And at this point, Tom is also fairly out of the picture on a lot of the minor stuff 
for operations. We've got an operations manager that's responsible for getting all the crews out in the morning and handling all of the customer issues, warranty claims, stuff like that. Yep. We interrupt this podcast today to talk to you very quickly about Tradey Web Guys content creation program. That program has been designed specifically for trade-based organizations as a way that you guys as trade business owners can start creating content that enables you to engage better with your customers and your potential customers. It will enable you to build trust and build rapport because what you're doing is you're investing in educating them. Biggest problem that we see with our customers today is that they're not regularly updating their websites. And that's a problem because first of all, the search engines are looking for that. And second of all, potential customers are also looking for it. Trady Web Guys content creation program has been specifically designed to help you get regular, relevant content on your website consistently every month. We know that it's hard when you're out there on the tools, and we know that sometimes you don't always have the time to be able to do these things yourself. So we're taking it off your hands for you. It's a service that we're offering for you guys. We want to make sure that you're getting this done because we know how important it is. Anyway, head across to tradywebguys.com.au forward slash content, fill in the form, and one of our representatives will come back to you. So let's talk about the growth because you know, obviously, you know, you've, you've grown quite a lot over the last seven years. Um, and I'm, I know coming with growth comes often a lot of problems. So um, I'm curious to see how uh, you guys tackled the, um, uh, the reality of a business that's growing fast. You need to employ staff, you need to train staff, you need to retain staff, you need to recruit. How, how does that process look and how's that evolved over the years through the journey of the business? Yeah, that's the absolute number one challenge. In any trades business is recruiting and staffing. You know, um, we're always hiring. That's the best way to say it. And mm-hmm. that's the best position to be in. You have to have, this goes back to the the Randall Dehart there, the 80% sales and marketing, 10% production, uh, 10% accounting. But when you've got sales coming in and a lead flow coming in, you can always be hiring so that you don't need to worry about where you're going to get your dollars from to pay your new hires or if you can afford a new hire. So that way, when you've got an opportunity to hire somebody good, you can hire them. So we essentially have a funnel set up for hiring. So we're always running ads, always hiring, always interviewing. When we find somebody that works, we've got a position for them. And we're generally looking for uh, younger guys that are fresh, you know, have no experience in the trade and that we can build from the ground up. Somebody that's going to be used to our standards, our values, hmm. and most importantly, you know, is not uh, is not going to be accustomed to a lot of the other baloney and the, you know, just horrible operations we have to compete with. We want somebody that's going to be on our level and we'd rather take them there from the ground up. Interesting. So that's, that's really the hiring thing. You know, hiring in talent uh, just hasn't worked out so well. And I can't say that I know anybody that it's worked out well for. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, you know, that whole cliche phrase, you know, hire for attitude, not skill. Um, sounds like it's certainly been applicable to you. Absolutely. <clears throat> I, I, I imagine, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's like over over there, but I know here there's there seems to be so much work around and so little labor that the hiring process is is quite stressful because there's so many jobs available for so few staff that they tend to um, get swayed by things like, well, I've been offered an extra five bucks an hour here with this guy. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So I'm curious, do you guys have a process around retention? You know, I can't say that we have a specific process around retention. I have been down that road that you just mentioned where, you know, so so and so is going to, you know, increase my pay 10%. (laughs) You know, unless you can do better than that, I won't be there on Monday. I've gotten those text messages more times than I can count. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I'm happy to say that we are far past that. Yeah, you, you get that when you employ dollar hoppers or try to hire in people right. that are already skilled. That's what you get. You get dollar hoppers. So building people from the ground up that are familiar with your company. And we try to make it a place that everyone likes to work at, whether that's, I shouldn't say weather, but there's you know a whole ball of wax that goes into that. We, we provide gym memberships, uh, company cell phones, yeah. breakfast and coffee in the morning. We try to make it, you know, a positive environment as best as we can. Granted, trades work is not easy. It is physical. It is strenuous. It is difficult. And for what it's worth, we try to make it as pleasant and um, professional and uplifting as we can, given the circumstances. So that way, you know, our guys don't want to leave. They don't want to go work for our competitors who pay less. Do mind you, we try to pay more than all of our competitors. I, I'm pretty sure we do. I, I can't say exactly for sure, but 
from what I hear, we're paying slightly above uh, slightly above standard from all the guys that work with us, and they're all happy. And they tell other people, and we've got people that are always, you know, at a moment's notice, ready to leave those other companies, our competitors, and that's worked for us. Yeah, right. So you've really, you've really put a lot of resource into building culture, is what I'm hearing. Exactly. Build the culture. You know, get the core group of guys built up, and then once you have that in place, it all just kind of falls back in. It's momentum. You know, you get that in place, and now they're talking to other people. They know other people that work other places and they're saying, yeah, over there, it's great. You know, we get all this, we get that, we get that. And then, yeah. you know, suddenly you kind of have this inflow, you know. So, um, you know, if we needed to hire somebody right now, we've got a list of people that we could call up. I'm curious with your, um, with, with any, any business that's growing, you know, leadership becomes obviously a relevant conversation when you're trying to manage teams of guys and installers and people out on the road and, and people within the office and department heads and all this kind of stuff. Um, how do you, do you guys have a, uh, a process around hiring or promoting leaders within the organization? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have a, I want to say flow chart, I guess it would be a hierarchy. Uh, we do have a hierarchy and we actually have it printed out. We keep it posted in our office of everyone's role. Like an so old everyone chart? Knows where, yeah, a chart. Yeah. Hierarchy chart, org chart, yeah. uh, whatever you want to call it. We got one for operations and we got one for the sales side of things. Mm -hmm. So everyone knows where they are and their specific roles and their specific actionables or qualifications that you need to meet to get to the next level. Okay. So um, you know, that kind of keeps everyone in check. Everyone knows who they need to go to. Having well-defined roles is crucial. That was something that we really lacked for the first year or two. It took us a while to figure it out. You know, yeah. People had two bosses, and they didn't know who to go to for what. Having well-defined roles is absolutely vital. And it yeah. sounds so simple as I'm saying it, but when you first start up a business and you're out there doing the work and you're trying to sell and you're trying to hire people, it can get confusing. And overlooked. I think, well, you've definitely touched on something that we're massively um, passionate about, and we've been putting a lot of work and emphasis into that with both our own company, with, with my company, and then with um, you know our clients as well. Because what we're you know we're really big these days on helping guys build and implement systems and processes and procedures and policies and that kind of thing. And all of that ties back into um, organizational chart because without that org chart, without those role departments roles, you can't create responsibilities on roles that don't exist. So, you know, in order to get that right, you, it, all, it all starts at the org chart. And I've, it's been an amazing, um, I've, I've learned a lot very recently and speaking to yourself, it sounds like you, you're on the same path. Yeah, absolutely. Org chart is 100% key. The other thing I, it sounds like you've done if, with either knowing it or not knowing that is something that um, uh, Al Levy, once again, he uh, he taught me a while back and he was saying, if you're trying to avoid, um, as you called them, the dollar hoppers, <laughs> which is quite mm -hmm. good, he said one thing that you need to do is be able to provide a career path and give you, you know, people that work in your organization some indication of where they could end up because the difference between, um, you know, somebody who's offering f an extra five bucks an hour or whatever it might be is is the career potential. And Danny Kerr from BT Academy out of um, out of British Columbia in Canada, he does a very similar thing in his training processes too. Like he makes sure that when people come in work for him, that he that they know where they could end up and they know that there's a clear path to get to those goals. What are those goals? How do you you set those goals do you want to buy a house do you want to do this and that okay well here's a roadmap to help you get there from working within our company so it sounds like you kind of got a similar uh, mindset and mantra there with with your with your team which i think is fantastic yeah absolutely you know having goals everyone wants some level of fulfillment they want to get to the next level they want to improve themselves and you need to have that and i know it's a real challenge as a small business because you don't necessarily have that infrastructure, you don't have that size. It's a challenge, but with what you have, you should always generally work towards setting something up and at least bringing your employees on board with the company's goals. So, hey, if we can sell this much, then we can, you know, open up another facility over here and expand to this area. You know, so when you run out of org chart or run out of growth chart, bring your employees on board with the actual goals of your company so they understand where you're working towards. Yeah. That's, you know, that's kind of my two cents on what is a difficult situation because a lot of trades businesses are lifestyle businesses. You know, they don't necessarily have an extreme growth path. Right, right. And I mean, in, in my experience as well, like that growth path, 
um, you, you can have both if you've if you've got the system systems implemented, which effectively don't put the emphasis directly on any one person. So you know, if you want to go away for a week or a month, you know, the, the processes are there, which can help people step into that role and fulfil those duties. You know, which basically replacing yourself. So, how does how does uh, your business look in that regard? I mean, you've got the org chart, you've got the roles, responsibilities. Do you guys have the document and systems and processes on how to do things like the delivery of services or the you know the operations in the office and that kind of stuff? Yeah, we do. I mean, we've got everything docked out, documented out very well, actually, uh, enough that I can leave the business and so can my business partner for an uh, extended period of time. Yeah, so doing pretty well in that regard. Uh, we've really got that in place. Our next level is really covering more ground, increasing our service area. Yeah. And so what, what do you use to document those systems? Where do they live? Where do they live? Primarily in what would be Word slash PDF files. And then what we'll do is hyperlink from there to explainer videos, which are in like a hidden YouTube account or not a hidden YouTube account, but on YouTube, just private. Okay. So nobody else can see it. So we've got what is essentially... Uh, standard operating procedure documents, uh, and they're you know in our company Dropbox. It's on all the company oh, okay. computers, and then from there, uh, anything that's documented in a video fashion is hyperlinked from those types of documents. Yeah, fantastic. And so, where did that whole? Where did you learn all that stuff from? I mean, did someone must have taught you how to do all that stuff over the years? I, you know, I think it's just school of hard knocks. There was never <laughs> anyone that said, "Hey, you need to make a standard operating procedure," because for the longest time, we didn't. Right. We didn't have it. And then somewhere along the lines, somewhere in my kind of ongoing, never ending educational process of reading books and blogs and talking yeah, to other yeah, people yeah, that are yeah. much further along, somebody must somewhere must have said something about, hey, you need to document your processes and you know map it out. And at that point, we started doing that. Actually, the, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, uh, what's the best book you've ever read? So what is it? <laughs> uh, best book, Good to Great by Jim Collins. Yeah, uh, that, that one really stands out. It's not contractor or trade specific, but it just encompasses so much. Uh, my favorite concept from there is fire bullets, then cannons. Right. I really like that. You, know, <laughs> you can just uh, you don't want to just go into anything gung ho. And I, I do this. I'd been doing this before I read the book and I didn't realize and then he said, it, I'm like, oh, wow, you know, this is actually a real concept that people Im- implement or employ go out there, test the water, test the water here, a little there. And then when you find something that works, when you actually land a shot, when you get your, when you get your, um, get your hands on something that has potential, then throw your resources at that. But until then, keep everything small and constrained, try a lot of little things, figure out what works. And then once you got something that works, scale that up, ramp it up and uh, yeah. fire bullets, then cannons from good to great. Yeah, we've always said similar things. It's always been ready, fire, aim, which basically means the same thing. I mean, you can't, you can, you can imagine that something is going to work for as much as you want, but until you get it into market and you actually start testing it, how do you know? Exactly. And especially when you look at, you know, websites and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's just the the best thing to do is get it live and then tweak it looking forward. And at least you can steer it. You know, I always say you can't steer a parked car, but it's true with with most That's things. It. You know, I mean, I'm not saying re- like get things out there that are not ready, but I'm just saying get it out there if it's almost ready. You know because at least then you can start getting real Absolutely. data back. Yeah, I mean, if you spend too much time getting it ready or perfect or perfect, trying to perfect something, once you set it up, you'll quickly find out that it isn't usually perfect. It's far from it. And then you just wasted so much time on perfecting it. Now you got to go, I don't want to say back to the drawing board, but you got to peel away a few layers of the onions and then rebuild. Yeah. So um, a lot of the the listeners out there are are quite um, interested in tools and technology and things like that. What are the main um, pieces of uh, technology or equipment that you guys use within the running of the business? So things like CRM or you mentioned Dropbox. Yeah, well, Dropbox, obviously, for holding all of our files. But CRM, we're using a program called KickServe. Uh, That said, we've been using it for several years and there might be some options out there. But we do use Kickserve primarily for field service management. I will say it is a little lacking in terms of sales or sales management or sales reporting. It doesn't really report a good close or it doesn't report closing rate or give many accurate, I shouldn't say many accurate, it doesn't 
it just doesn't yeah. have intuitive reporting for sales on the sales side of things. Mm-hmm. So I really feel like it's lacking there. So Kickserve, if you're listening, uh, there's some feedback from me. <laughs> and you can certainly look up my company and you'll see my account. <laughs> so if I were going to look for a new CRM, that that would be something I'd really be looking for is the uh, something that's really good on the sales side and then also in the field service management side. So it works great in the field service management and scheduling, but for sales, it's not too good. Uh, the other thing we're using is an email program called Front App. I've been really impressed with that. So this is a plug for them unintentionally. I just genuinely love the program. What is it? Uh, it's called Front App. And it's it, it turns their I guess their slogan or tagline is is that we turn your email into a help desk. Okay. So at my company, we've got leads coming in from multiple online sources and they all go to our main company email address, which is like office at gulfcoastaluminum.com. So you got that box which gets or used to get hundreds of mails and messages a day. And from there we can assign them rather than like CCing, you can just assign them. Uh, so we all have access to the office at, and we can assign them from there. And we can set up rules so that when the leads come in from Facebook, they get assigned to certain people. When the leads come in for, to our website, based on which service criteria they select, they get assigned to certain people. And then we can all comment on them. So if a customer emails me about something, and I don't really know much about what the customer's issue is, or I wasn't much involved with the project, but they still emailed me, I can go in there, and in the computer system, I can say, or in the email system in front app, I can say. Hey, Andrew, who's one of my you know right hand man, what's going on with this? What do I need to know? And then Andrew can type up a response in there, and then I can basically send that response coming from me. So okay. it's like a ticket system, but the customer never sees that. To the customer, it's all just email, but behind the scenes, it is awesome because we don't need to CC anybody. We don't need to yell across the office like, hey, what's going on with this project? Blah, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. It's uh, it's a real nifty thing. We can also put comments in there, and we're using it a lot for follow up. So we get canned responses. Yeah. And we can see some actions that they've taken, get notifications based on their emails. So we're using it for follow ups. It's um, it's been pretty good, pretty yeah, nifty cool, program. Cool. And I suppose looking forward, then um, I mean, conscious of your time, um, I don't want to take too much more of it, but I'd just like to know, I suppose, uh, you know, where you see the business heading, and you know, where you see yourself. Absolutely, yeah. So. Right now, we just need to cover more ground or we want to cover more ground. We operate our business in a four-county area. So that would be, let's just say, 100 miles north and south, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we That's a relatively small market. So we're little fish in this huge pond and we want to expand. We're going to need to get you know more facilities, expand out that way. The biggest constraint, of course, is hiring. So we'll need to set up these facilities and staff and rebuild teams at each one of these locations. So cover Mm. more ground, cover the entire state of Florida. Right now, we are really just a small little drop of rain in this big bucket for that. Yeah, great. And and I suppose with that comes a whole nother basket of potential issues. You know, if you're going to be scaling, you know, within 100 miles, you probably need to have different locations that guys can, you know, come and go from. Um, have, you, have you strategized how that might look? Yeah, we have. Um, there's, you know, a pretty good, pretty good plan in place that we've got for that. Yeah. Our, our biggest issue, you know, we do great on the sales and marketing side. We can, we can basically cover any area that we want now. Our website gets over a thousand visitors a day. And the thing is, and this is actually a bit of a problem for us, a problem to the point where we've actually kind of started, I don't want to know how to say this, but tuning down our website because we get so many phone calls and so many inquiries from people that are outside of the state or not outside of the state, but outside of our service area. And they find our content and our content is very helpful. So they find it and they feel that we're just the helpful resource and they just call us to ask questions or email in. So that's actually been quite a big problem for us. Uh, anyways, we, yeah, I mean, you, you laughed, but um, at one point we tried, we tried actually outsourcing some of our bookings and our inbound phone call handling. Yeah. And the company that we had hired to do this, they do this for multiple trades businesses and their pay per booking. They actually, they didn't quite cut us as a client, but they refused to take any of our phone calls that were not coming from a paid traffic source because four out of five of them were essentially valueless. You couldn't book it. You just had people calling in to ask questions or ask for a referral. Right. I mean, it was, it was actually, it's actually quite a problem. We actually had to start removing content from our website you know, to scale down the traffic and inquiries like that. So that traffic, just while you're on that topic, a lot of it came through uh, like organic content on the yeah, that, Gulf that Coast all- aluminum side or? 
organic search because you know with pay, pay per click you can control the areas and that that stuff always does well and organic does well too but it was essentially doing too well because you know we're a small business covering this little 100 mile swatch area and meanwhile you've got people all over the country finding this and we're the only one publishing information on it so when they have questions or want a service provider they would call us. I mean, you know, they'd even call us. They'd be like, well, I know it says on your website that you only cover these counties, but could you make an exception and come up here? <laughs> you know, I mean, we would get that stuff all day long. I mean, I kid you not. It was frustrating. Yeah. Right. You know, so essentially, I mean, we can cover wherever we want at this point. It's just a matter of building up the human resources and rebuilding another team in another, lo- another location. Right. You know, at this point, we've built up the team here and while it sounds so easy, as I may have explained it, you know, oh, you just do this and you're constantly hiring and you put in these values and blah, 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 blah. It, it's a real challenge. And those listening yeah. certainly know the pain and frustration associated with it. That's brilliant. Well, mate, look, it's been a great conversation. Um, I'm, I'm glad we had it because it, uh, we've been trying to do this for a little while. <laughs> I suppose both with their busy schedules, it hasn't really got around to it. But, mate, I want to thank you for your time. Before I go, I normally ask uh, guests on the, on the show here uh, who they'd like to see on the show next. So do you have anyone in mind, uh, caveat, that you can introduce me to to come on the show? Hmm. Have you had... Um well, there, I guess there's two people. One of them you may have had, but uh, Randall DeHart, he's an accountant. He's great, great with them talking about the numbers. And he's also built and sold a couple service businesses at this point. Okay. So he's a great person to have on the show. The other one is, her name is Ellen Rohr. And she's, oh, I'm yeah. not sure how, but she's affiliated with yeah, Al. Yeah. I've had Ellen and, on the show uh, a number of times. They, <laughs> oh, you have? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. I've listened to, I may have listened to her on your podcast. I don't know where I've heard her, but uh, yeah. she's absolutely great to listen to. She's the best. And uh, certainly worth having her back on the show. I mean, you know, when it comes to building a culture and recruiting and hiring people, she's got some great advice on there. Yeah, I think uh, on that topic. Ellen is certainly one of the uh, most requested guests back to come back on the show. <laughs> Ellen and Al. <laughs> I actually had Ellen and Al together on the show once, and that was a riot. They, they both, we did a conversation between all three of us, which was hilarious. Um, but I'll, I'll yeah, send, that would certainly be good. I'm going to have to, when I'll we hang up here and you. I get a few minutes, I'm going to have to go search <laughs> for those episodes. Yeah, I'll flick them onto you. They're, they're really funny. Um, Corey, all right. Well, thank you very much, sir. Um, just uh, before we leave, I suppose, um, if people want to get hold of you, you've got a fantastic blog, which people can get, get to through homeprosuccess.com, um, just spelt as it's uh, said. Um, you can head across there. You can get hold of that. Um, there's that cool infographic as well, which you can get to through that same uh, webpage. And if anyone wants to check out uh, the Gulf Coast Aluminum uh, business, they can head across to Gulf Coast Aluminum. That's A L U M I N U M for you Aussies dot uh, com. Uh, anything else, mate? You wanted to leave behind? Uh, where else can people get hold of you? No, nothing. Uh, you covered it all there, homeprosuccess.com. There's a connect page on there where you can basically just send me an email. Don't be afraid to reach out. I'm always available. Yep. And for the listeners out there as well, Corey's in the in the Facebook community. So if you've got any questions, by all means, you can jump in there and ask him and I'll um I'll post some links to Corey, your uh, uh, that infographic that we spoke about um, throughout the show there, the valve, the valve stem sales strategy, uh, that you put together. Um, all right, mate, I think that was it. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, much appreciated. Look forward to chatting in the future and, um, mate, we look, thank you for being part of the group. I know your conversations and comments are very much appreciated. Thank you for listening to another episode of Toolbox Talks. If you're liking what you hear, then you can head across to the siteshed.com where you can join our community by signing up to our toolbox talks, uh, you'll get sent a weekly notification, which is basically a highlight of everything that we've spoken about during that week, along with any other industry news that may be relevant or specific to the trades. If you're enjoying the show, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, where you can leave us a review. Uh, That would be fantastic, and all the reviews get read out in the show. Uh, Likewise, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from the show and the, the episodes that we create, then please go ahead and share it with them.